Welcome to Top 5, a show where we count things down from number 5 all the way to number 1. And this week is uh, inspired by a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, where I once again mentioned that I believe 1984 is the best year of movies ever. And so this week on the show, Top 5 Movies of 1984, the Top 5 Movies of 1984. Now, here's something that's interesting. These are, of course, always with these lists. These are our personal favorites. Uh, you can disagree with us or, you know, uh, uh, agree with us. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. You can have your own list. Why? Because everybody loves a list. But uh, this week, we actually have the numbers of the top, in this case, top 10 movies from 1984 that I'm going to share along with our top fives. And we'll see if any of the top 10 movies fall in any of our top five lists. So Matthew is here. Hello, Matthew. How are you? Rodrigo is here. Hello, Rodrigo. Hello. Are you guys ready to try this thing? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm going to do, because we've only got five, and I've got the list of the top ten, uh, and we're going to go two at a time for uh, the box office grosses. So at number ten was the movie Splash. Tom Hanks and uh, uh, Daryl Hannah. I will say that this was the first date movie I ever went on. Oh. Ooh. Number nine. Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Did that hit on anybody's list? No, but such a good movie. It is such a good movie. I did go and see that uh, with my dad and with my sister at the drive-in movie theater when the second weekend that it came out. So, yeah. All right. So my number five then is a, a movie that I discovered when my dad brought it home on VHS. It was a movie that did not do very well in the box office. And he's like, yeah, I got this. You might enjoy it. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, it looks interesting. There's a spaceship on the front and a cool looking dude and some other crazy things. And so I started watching it and it starts off by saying, you know, uh, this guy's parents were scientists and they died in an experiment trying to, you know, cross over into the eighth dimension. And then we learn all about Buckaroo Banzai and the Hong Kong Cavaliers. And I watched that thing with like, what is this crazy trippy movie? that I am being exposed to a Kansas kid being exposed to uh, with all this new wave influence and everything that was in it. And of course, really great sci-fi and really great actors and really great comedy. And also, you know, crazy serious uh, stuff that's in there. And then the end credits where everybody's walking down the LA uh, um, uh, basin or the LA river. And they're all uh, walking as the credits are rolling. And there's a promise of another Buckaroo Banzai movie coming. Of course, I'm talking about the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai subtitle across the eighth dimension such a fantastic movie that is, if you want a movie that is full of, Hey, it's that guy moments. Yes. Then adventures of Buckaroo Banzai is that moment where you're like, if these people weren't already, uh, uh, big, uh, stars, then they were about to be big stars. So like Peter Weller, I think it was another year or two before he did Robocop. Uh, yeah. Christopher Lloyd was already a big star. John Lithgow, uh, was he also in Cuckoo's Nest? I don't remember. Um, but I think Lithgow John Lithgow was in the world according to Garvey. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So he was a big yeah, yeah. Deal. So he was a big deal too. But just like every Ellen Barkin as Penny Pretty, Jeff Goldblum. I mean, just a, the uh, um, um, what's his name who plays uh, Lex Luthor and went on to uh, do a bunch of other stuff uh, is Spencer in there. Brown. Yeah, so many great people in this movie. So if you've never had a time to check out the Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, what are you waiting yep. for? That's my number five. It's also my number five. Ah, oh, awesome, great. And if you ever wanted to see Carla Tortelli's husband and the science teacher from Fast Times at Ridgemont High yeah. playing aliens like they naturally should have, yeah. this is the movie for you. Yeah, I mean, now, I will tell again, you, it's so much. Oh, it's that guy. Oh, it's that guy. It's like that guy. I, yeah. And at the time, I didn't know who these people were. No. And that's why we know them now. But the thing that I always like to keep in mind is I did not see Buckaroo Bonsai in 1984. I didn't even see Buckaroo Banzai in the 80s. I did not see this movie <laughs> until well into college. Why? And I don't know. I don't know why. So I think it was I, I will one say of those this. things where. This was one of those movies that if you didn't, if you didn't have a dad or somebody just randomly pick this up from the video mm -hmm. store on a Friday <laughs> night or something and then bring it home to you, chances are you didn't see it. Because I don't remember if this ever aired on HBO because I don't remember my uncle ever sending it to me. Although it probably did, but, uh, this is one of those things that once you found it, if you were part of that in group, you knew it. And me and my friend, Mike love this movie. 
Uh, yeah, and everybody else just thought it was one cool, of the so. cool kids. See, the thing that got me about it, and it may just have been that at the time, you know, I'm 13 years old. I live in a small town. There's one movie theater. And as you mentioned, 1984 was chock full of movies. There were tons of good movies. And I remember, you know, seeing all of the films in the top 10, which I've heard and you guys will hear soon. But I had, for some reason, Buckaroo Bonds, I had never really hit my radar except as such a cool name. The name Buckaroo mm-hmm. Banzai is mm-hmm. just incredible. Yeah. It is such a perfect name. And by the time, I didn't see RoboCop until my senior year of high school, which would have been 88. So I saw RoboCop and I was like, oh, the dude from RoboCop. And somebody said, yeah, he was also Buckaroo Banzai. And I'm like, oh. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned on my Twitter this week, sometimes I'm late to stuff. But when you're late to stuff, it's great because... Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Otter Disaster, my my college roommate. Sure. His wife loves Buckaroo Bonsai. Oh, really? Their passion. And she, I mean, she lives and dies by this movie. I, I, I believe that her hall pass list is just Clancy Brown five times. <laughs> but yeah, th- this is a movie that is pure. This is built to be a cult movie. Every scene is filled with these moments and there's these real crazy subtleties involved. And then you have moments where I don't know if you've paid attention, but I, it it occurred to me once at one point where when they're walking through the LA river, which by the way, at the end, that is in fact, the Los Angeles river. Mm -hmm. That's what they have. That is a river. Perfect. Tommy is so perfect that he actually changes clothes while walking down the river. And I think that that some people might call that a continuity error. I call that proof of concept. You're showing us that perfect Tommy is perfect because he just changed clothes in five seconds off camera. That's how perfect he is. And that's why this movie is my number five. There you go. Rodrigo, what do you have for your number five? Is it also the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai colon across the eighth dimension? It is not. Buckaroo no. Banzai got, got pushed out by some other stuff. Uh, unfortunately, okay. uh, uh. I do. I do enjoy Buckaroo Banzai. It's a good movie. It's a, it's nice because it feels like when I watched it, I was like, is this a sequel to something? <laughs> like, feels it, like it, yeah. it, it, it does. It does have that serialized feel to a movie that only one was made of. Yep. Um, Issue five of six. Yep. So my number five is uh, a scary movie, an action mm. movie, and a love story all Ooh. rolled up into one. All right. Um, and here's where I start sniping your lists. Probably uh, my number five is the Terminator. Oh, the Terminator yeah. is my number four, which we'll get to in just a moment. So go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the Terminator is the story of a young woman who uh, is told that her kid is going to be the leader of the future rebellion against the machines. But she's like, nah. And the Terminator shows up and he's like, um, this Give me movie your clothes, is your bicycle at fifteen dollars. Yeah, this movie is basically its own genre. Like it is a horror movie, mm-hmm. sort of, and it is an action movie. But it's the sort of like the thing is coming for you. Uh, wasn't all that well trod at that time, right? It's like obviously every Terminator movie has become that, uh, but also other movies like. Um, drag me to hell or it follows Mm -hmm. like yeah i've like you know there's a little bit of terminator in those uh, in those movies too it's a very influential movie uh if for no other reason that it is immensely quotable yeah and Mm -hmm. uh maintains itself in people's uh sort of pop culture brains so usually if you reference the terminator people will respond to that yeah this was sarah connor this is such a great movie when it came out. Again, I ended up seeing it on VHS. It's an R-rated movie. Uh, you know, I'm 13, 14 years old, not allowed to go see R-rated movies. <laughs> Mom and Dad, little did they know. <laughs> as soon as I got my driver's license, I was into every R-rated movie there was. Um, but, you know, and of course, there's the the sex scene, the gratuitous uh, boobies uh, on the on the, the screen. But There are boobies in Terminator? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I did uh, not remember that. Yeah, yeah. There's all well. How do you think that uh, John Con- Connor is uh, born? Uh, how do you think he got made? Uh, so wait, you're a, saying in order for someone to have children, they first have to show their breasts on they camera? They have to. They have to get uh, naked no, on somebody, camera. Somebody does. It's yeah. just a prerequisite. Uh, yeah, yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, 
you know, this was a this was a James Cameron. So uh, this is my controversial statement for the next five minutes because mm-hmm. I'm sure I've got more. Sure. Um, this is the best Terminator movie. Okay, I know people yeah. are going to say no. Terminator Two is the best movie, and you know you can have that opinion. But there's something about 1984, and all, I've said this before with uh, Star Wars, for example. Uh, 77 is got this very gritty look, but by the time you get to Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, everything's against this really clean, glossy sheen. And you look at Terminator, and it's also this very gritty movie. James Cameron is is coming at this with a low budget, essentially a low budget at the time. A lot of stop motion special effects. He's coming from um. Oh, what's his name? Uh, did the first Fantastic Four movie and all the other cheap, uh, cheap movies. Corman? Yeah, oh, yeah, Roger he, Corman. yeah, he worked for Roger Corman. He was uh, in charge of directing or he took over the directing of the Piranha. Was it three or just the Piranha movie? Everybody got either LSD poisoning or food poisoning. And he had this trippy dream, fever dream, where he dreamed up this movie from that. And you can that's why it Rodrigo is. It does have that that horror movie sci fi feel to it, but also has that love story. Again, it, like a Buckaroo Banzai, it takes place in California, Los Angeles. It's got a lot of new wave aesthetic uh, in it uh, as well, especially with Linda Carter's character, Sarah Connor. Uh, and it is, it's just to me, I can watch this movie a lot um, just because of, as Matthew said, how quotable it is, but just the action mm-hmm. sequence, the special effects, the low budget special effects, that were at the time this was before you got into any massive computer generated imagery uh, or anything like that. Um, but then you jump up to Terminator 2 and suddenly everything is slick and clean and computer graphic y. And I don't know, it just loses some of the charm from the original. But yeah, my number my number four movie from 1984 is definitely The Terminator. So featuring 12 year old Bill Paxton as a gang tough for about <laughs> yeah, five yeah. yeah, I don't think he was oh, 12 yeah, years I'll- old, but yeah, yeah. All of his, all of his friends are already there. Yeah, um, yeah. It's like Bishop the Android is in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. I love that guy too. Yeah. All right. Uh, as we go back and we look at the top grocers in our number eight and number seven slots, we have Romancing the Stone, Kathleen Kennedy and uh, Michael Douglas. A great Kathleen movie. Turner. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathleen Turner. What did I say? Kathleen Douglas. Uh, Kennedy. Kathleen Kennedy. 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 Oh yeah, that's somebody <laughs> completely different. Uh, but, uh, yeah, very, very fine movie. Um, if you have seen the movie Argyle, you really owe it to yourself to, uh, seek therapy and then go and watch Romancing the Stone because you will see that, uh, Argyle is just a ripoff of that. In at number seven, top grossing movie from 1984, Footloose with Kevin Bacon and John Lithgow. Yep. More John Lithgow. Yeah. All right. Uh, Matthew or anybody have Romancing the Stone or Footloose on their list. No, I'm All sorry, right. go Fitch. All right, Matthew, what do you have for your number four? My number four, uh, this is a show, and I don't know if you guys know this, called Top Five. And every week, we come in with five, and people count down from five to one. But somehow, my number four still goes to 11. Because my number four also has a colon subtitle. This is Spinal Tap, colon, a rockumentary by Martin DeBergy. And it was I think my first introduction to the idea of the mockumentary, basically the history of something that never happened. So I'm 12, 13 years old. And my friend, uh, we called him the stork, the stork, uh, I thought he was, was your partly cousin. Called that. No, no, no. My cousin was Elwood. Oh, okay. no, the stork, the stork was named because he was six, two in the fifth grade. And also because like the character from, um, from Animal House. Uh, Animal House, he might have had brain damage. Wonderful man. Great human being. He was a solid, solid fellow. But he showed me this weird Saturday Night Live bit with these three guys. And I'm like, that's that's Lenny and Squiggy guy. And so he's like, yeah, this is from a movie. And so we watched the movie. And the movie is so perfect. Mm-hmm. Because if you actually, I think there's, I can't remember if it had been out at this point, but there's a movie called History of the Western World Part Two: The Metal Years. And there's an interview with Ozzy Osbourne in that movie that I really feel is, even if it happened afterwards, is the, the heart and soul of Spinal Tap, a band that used to be big, used to be huge, and now are complete losers, but don't know it. 
And this guy is basically doing a documentary of them as the over the hill guys. This is their last hurrah. And they think they're still on top. And again, as with so many of the films we've had, it's so quotable. None, none more black. No, it's it, it's right. Couldn't it's, it's a black album. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But you watch this movie, and first of all, I do not believe that these are the same three guys who were later the Folksmen in a very similar movie called A Mighty Wind, another mockumentary. Sure. But the same three guys. And they're incredibly talented guys. At the time, I think two of them were on Saturday Night Live regularly. Harry Shearer and uh, Christopher Guest were regulars on the show. And, of course, Michael McKeon was Lenny. But as you watch this movie, this is another one with everybody in it. Dana Carvey is in this for a second. Patrick McNee, John Steed himself, appears in this movie. Paul Schaefer pops up in this thing, and if you just sit and watch it and take it in, you will find yourself just completely engulfed in the the dead smoke of a band that is is just on their way out. And there is nothing more heartbreaking than them hearing their own song on the radio, listening to the song. It breaks up a fight. They're having a big fight, and their song plays on the radio, and they all stop, and they listen, and everybody's happy. And then the radio guy comes in and says, hey, currently residing in the where are they now file. And they're literally in town to play that night. The most heartbreaking moment on film, or at least a heavy competitor. My number four, this is Spinal Tap, colon, blah, 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 fish cakes. I think really, uh, really they're cool. working on a sequel to that. What are they going to call it? I think it, this is Spinal Tap 2. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. This, uh, You know what they should call it? Going to 11. Yeah, maybe that's what the two is, maybe an 11. Um, why, don't, why don't you just make 10 higher and then just have have it be 10 and have 10 be louder? But 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 this one, this one goes to 11. All right, Rodrigo, what do you have for your number four? Uh, my number four is a movie that uh, really changed the way that I looked at movies in a lot of ways because it was scary and funny at the same time. Um, most movies are either scary or funny, but uh, Gremlins mm -hmm. is both scary and funny. And the little monsters are funny, but also they're scary. So it's like, it comes from the same place. If you look at something like, uh, I don't know, Shaun of the Dead, right? S scary movie comedy movie at the same time it's like the comedy usually comes from the people and the monsters are scary but in gremlins it all kind of comes from the gremlins so um yeah once i was old enough to watch this my parents let me watch it and i thought it was hilarious and also i thought it was pretty scary like good good solid like kid scary movie yeah and i hmm i wonder matthew hmm. i went to go see gremlins when it came out in theaters uh, I think I just went by with my friends. I don't think I went with my family. Um, I thought it was more of a fun adventure and it's only later in life when I've watched it again, where I'm like, Oh no, this is a horror movie. Yeah. Oh, Oh, absolutely. And the horror is so subtle. Oh no. Uh, somebody I getting run over by a snowblower machine. That's, that's not subtle. Uh, well, you know, I guess having, telling the, telling really the story well of your, your father crawling into the chimney and dying because he wanted you to have a happy Christmas. That's not subtle. Right. <laughs> it's subsumed into the story kind yeah, of like yeah. real life. I mean, there's a point early on where Zach Galifianakis, no, Zach, what's his face, finds his dog hanging. Yeah, from the And Christmas it's like movie. someone yeah. tried to kill his dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are points in that movie that are absolutely hilarious, but there's also a point where we laugh at a 70-year-old woman being rocketed out a window to her death. Polly, Polly Holiday died in that scene, and we yeah. all know it. Yeah, I, yeah. It, so, it's yeah. also, it, there's something about it that just feels morbidly charming. Humorous. Yeah. Yes. And I knew this was going to be on Rodrigo's list because every single game, every single character he has played on Critical Hit, every time we get into something that Rodrigo has a part of the narrative, there's always that horrifying fusion of comedy and just like gut-wrenching terror. 
And people still mock me about the candle heads, you know, the guys whose heads were on fire and melting. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that is not funny. That is not funny. Oh, it's funny. That is horrifying. Yeah. That is the most terrible thing. <laughs> All right. And I'm just like, yeah, I knew this was in Rodrigo's DNA. Man. Here we have, and now we're starting to get into probably a lot of complicated territories because mm -hmm. we're looking at the um, number six and number five top movies of 1984. At number six is Police Academy. Oh. And at number five, The Karate Kid, which is my number one. <gasps> Again, this is one where I think every teenager in the tri-state area went to go see Karate Kid on opening weekend at our little movie theater that had one screen in Ottawa, Kansas. At the time, it was a one-screen theater. Wait, and what was the third state? Because I've been to Ottawa. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's the tri-state area. It, the, you know, you tri, can see the tri-state the tri-state yeah, area in Kansas is a span that's larger than Europe. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. Kansas and Kansas and another part of Kansas. So I remember Kansas, I went with Texas my friend, uh, my friend Jeff and I, and there was maybe like two other people. I because th I think there were like four or five of us, and we were all standing around waiting for to get into the movie, the, the seven o'clock showing or whatever it was. And this woman comes out, the line was, you know, down the block and around the corner. Um, it's one of the few times that I remember seeing such a long line for, for a movie. And she came down and she was counting and she gets to, um, she gets to me and she's like, you're the last one. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, we, you, you will be the last person to get a seat in this theater. And everybody oh. else, everybody else has to wait for the next showing. <gasps> and so we went in all granted all of us got to go in. Um, oh. but you know, everybody else behind us, nobody I knew. And if it was somebody I knew, well, screw them. Cause I got to go see a uh, karate kid before they did. Right. Um, but we literally had four seats in the front row of this movie theater. And it was glorious to see karate kid feeling the energy of the audience, feeling the, you know, the humor of, of karate kid. Seeing, uh, seeing everybody in, you know, 40 foot high screen, uh, Elizabeth shoe and a 40, you know, 40 foot high screen was just phenomenal. And yeah. it, it is still today. One of my favorite movies of all time. And it's my number one. It only came in at number five at the box office, uh, from Columbia pictures, bringing in $90 million. Can you imagine that the number five movie of 1984 only brought in $90 million? Yeah. You're going to surprise. That, what's that in 2024? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't work with the inflation calculator that quick, but it's, it's probably close to, it'd probably be a, what, a $500 million movie today. Um, I don't know. So, uh, karate kid is my number one karate kid on anybody else's list. Nope. No. Right. Um, my number three then is Indiana Jones and the Temple of doom, which is number three on the top five movies in 1984 bringing in 179 double, almost double the pri uh, uh, the profit of the uh, box office gross of the karate kid gremlins in at number four, just so you know, oh, um, uh, Indiana Jones and the temple of doom is one of those where we would try to go. Uh, I would try to go see the movie, the first showing on Friday. And what would normally happen is my mom would drop me off at the movie theater. This happened with ET. This happened with, uh, Indiana Jones and the temple of doom, and a couple of other movies where she would drop me off at the movie theater at like four o'clock or five o'clock and, and probably five o'clock. And the movie didn't start until six or seven. And I would just sit there while she went and did errands while everyone lined up behind me. So I'd be like the first or second person in line. And then she would show up, you know, 10 minutes uh, right as soon as the box office opened and she would just walk right in with me. And then we would wait for the movie to begin. But Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is a very, very good movie. Uh, it's not my favorite of the Indiana Jones uh, movies. Um, and I had a chance to watch this again recently. And again, it's one that as a kid, I was enthralled by the action of the adventure and Kate Capshaw and all of the, the, the things that were going on, but watching it again and having read the novelization shortly after the movie came out, this is a very dark movie. I mean, it's certainly, I would think one of the darkest of the Indiana Jones movies simply because of the subject matter that's going on, uh, the slavery thing that's going on, the colonialization that's going on, uh, the, you know, especially the enslavement sure. of children to find the, uh, other, uh, uh, 
Sankara, the Shankara stones or whatever they are. Um, it's, it is a darker movie that I didn't expect to see, but at the time I eat that stuff up. And so, uh, yeah. Um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, my number three. All right, uh, Matthew, what do you have for your number three? My number three is actually a twofer. Okay. Uh, which makes it six. But it's a, maybe the only time that I'm aware of that the film and its sequel, which were not made simultaneously, came out in the same year, like six months apart. Mm-hmm. But it's also on my list for a very important reason. Primarily, my number three is Break In 2, Electric Boogaloo. But since Break In came out in May of 84, I feel like you kind of treat them as a unit, sort of like, you know, the Peter Jackson films that were broken up into three movies, but you still have to sit and watch them all and you have to spend 16 hours. And the thing about break in and break in two that I, I I feel is very important is it's one of those, uh, we call them fad movies. Um, I call them fad movies. And when I say we, it's the regal we, but it was based on a documentary made the year before. And when it came out, the break dance craze was kind of actually starting to chill down a little bit. And so the movie came out and half the audience was like, Hey, this is, this is cool, fresh dope, whatever you say. And half the movie went, this is so last year, but then they immediately put it out the sequel break in two, which is a, the superior film, a uh, B three stars from Roger Ebert out of a possible four, which is almost 75%, which I'm pretty sure means that it's nearly half of the, the available stars. But both movies are almost archetypical. I mean, Electric Boogaloo has become like part of the the common lexicon. Whenever you make a joke about, oh my God, there's another thing coming out, another movie, another game, another show, you tack on Electric Boogaloo to mock it. But the movies themselves are really just straightforward. They're sweet. They're kind-hearted. The first movie is the story of two street dancers. Uh, of course, uh, Shabadu Quinones, uh, just, just before his career-defining turn in Gablamicus the movie. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they take in uh, a young girl who's a ballerina, Special K, and they teach her to become part of their, their uh, 47-man dance troupe so that they can win against a group which, by the way, I don't know if they contained Ice-T or if Ice-T was just their rapper, but it's also the the first appearance of, of Ice-T musically and in film. And by the way, Ice-T has said of Breakin and his performance in it that it is, and I quote, whack. <laughs> and that that's high praise, I'm telling you. But if you if you only know them as punchlines. I actually saw break in two, and this is true in 2023. And I watched it several times. So I had a chance to really digest it. Mm -hmm. It's not a terrible movie. It's not a great movie. It's entertaining. It's fun. It's silly. And these dancers are so talented and you have the rappers who are really talented, including ice T you have all of these characters, you know, running around and, the first one has, of course, Shooter McGavin, so you can't go wrong with Shooter McGavin. Not playing a villain for, I think, the only time in his entire career. <laughs> Christopher McDonald, always a villain here. He's a sweet, cool guy. If you've never seen the movie, I, I implore you to take a chance. I don't know if they're streaming. Probably not. Oh, they're available. I know that they're, they're both available on Blu-ray. Just sit and watch them. Are they terrible? Maybe. If I was going to, you know, numerically say, well, am I actually analyzing these movies? Maybe, maybe not. But I remember being fascinating. And this is, of course, uh, Stephen, where Cousin Elwood comes in. Because Cousin Elwood and I were two chunky boys from the Midwest. And we were absolutely sold that the future was breakdancing and ninja throwing stars. So did you get and some so, uh, parachute pants and, and try to join a, a break-in like a group? Big, a big piece of cardboard. They didn't make parachute pants and a boy's husky, so I had Sears tough skins, but <laughs> I did have, and this is true, I had a pair of the first Jordans because my grandmother, God love her, she was a depression grandmother uh, in all senses of the word, but she came from the depression. She had this belief that the most expensive item was probably the one that would last the longest, and so she saw leather shoes 
that were priced more. And she said, these are what we're going to get you because you're going through shoes like corn through a goose. Uh, that's, that is 100% a true quote from my grandma Peterson, by the way. But, and she got me, so I had the cool Jordans and they, they didn't help. I was still a chunky kid from the Midwest, but I love these movies. I still really love these movies. And if you watch the second one, there is a, a romance subplot with Boogaloo Shrimp, who, by the way, is just amazing. That man should be somewhere. Someone should go back and they should say, look at Boogaloo Shrimp. Look at how wonderful, how charismatic, how entertaining he is. And just go, yes. And then you're like, okay, that's cool. I want to see a whole movie about him. But nonetheless, he has this romance subplot that is ridiculous. At one point, he breaks his leg, but it's not really broken because he immediately starts dancing, except maybe it is broken. But his romance is with a girl who only speaks Spanish, and he only speaks English, and he's trying to figure out how to communicate with her. And, of course, the only thing he can use is the language of the dance, my friends. So, break in two, colon, slash, break in, my number three. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, listeners, if you're out there going, oh, you're being silly, you're being goofy, no. I'm being sincere. I'm being heartfelt. Go see these movies. Here's a, if you want a better follow-up. Uh, to those after you've seen them, I would encourage mm-hmm. people to go watch the documentary Electric Boogaloo, oh. the wild untold, untold story of the Canon films. It is, yeah. it is a wild look at everything that came out of, of Canon, uh, during, during that time before it got broke up and sold off and everything. And the story of Breakin' and Breakin' two is told in there as well as this, uh, story about Lombada and Lombada, the, the forbidden dance, uh, and how yes. those things came about. Uh, so I would really encourage people to go watch a documentary. I just watched it again recently. It is a phenomenal documentary that is just straight up interview after interview with people telling their side of the story. And it's not yeah. kind to, uh, to, uh, uh, go to Globus. the Golan and Globus. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, you know, those, those guys were just masters of the zeitgeist cause they did death wish. Oh, you need to they watch it. You need to watch that. Action. You need to watch that movie because it was literally watch the documentary because it is amazing that they were just like, Oh yeah, we're going to uh, confirm that we're going to make 10 movies today and they're right. going to be done by next week. And just the Ninja lies, three, the domination, just the lies and the scheming and the, let's just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks kind of attitude is kind of inspiring. So people check that out, but you know, we're, we're running long on time. So Rodrigo, what do you have for your number three? My number three is, Ghostbusters. Hey, my number two is Ghostbusters. And also the number one movie of 1984, Ghostbusters. Oh, I didn't know that. $229 uh, million. Dollars. So, yeah, what what is there to say about Ghostbusters that hasn't already been said? Uh, it is the only time that I have uh, looked at a bunch of conservatives and thought, hey, these guys are cool. You know, because <laughs> Because they're the ones trying to do like unregistered like reactor crimes in their mm-hmm. uh, in their abandoned uh, fire firehouse, and the EPA shows up to bust them. Mm-hmm. And is like suddenly protecting the environment is the bad guy. Good times. Uh, it is. Uh, it is in my uh, number two slot, just because. It's the Ghostbusters. And again, it's the best of all the Ghostbusters movies. Uh, I know some people really dig Ghostbusters too. I don't know why, but uh, it's out there. Uh, but there's something again about this. There's just enough hints. Uh, well, it's not hints. It's straight out out there uh, of some inappropriate behavior by ghosts and people and other things. But it comes off as sure. so funny that as a teenager, this is the stuff that, you crack up because you're at that age where no, this is a PG related rated movie. It's going to be fine, but they're slipping those things in. And if you know, you know, you know, and I think that added to it. Uh, plus the mu- the, the theme song, uh, was all over the radio that year. You couldn't get away from it. Uh, it was just great catchphrase, great fun acting, uh, just, just fun. Top, top to bottom. Uh, so yeah, I can see why Ghostbusters, you're number three. It's at my number two. It was number one at the box office, as I said, 
$229 million, which uh, I did do the uh, inflation calculator. That's $689 million today. So by today's standards, it would be considered yeah. a flop. <laughs> sure. That's that's because today's standards are crap. I know, I know. That was, that was being uh, sarcastic I there. But, I, yeah. uh, I, I was trying okay. to, you know. Let's see. So we've done our number three. I just did my number two. Mm-hmm. And we've um, uh, four and three on the list, I said, was Gremlins and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which we've crossed off our lists. So, yep. Matthew, what do you have at your number two? My number two is that rare movie that is the beginning of a massive franchise and also the best of a massive franchise. And by massive, I mean more than five movies. My number two is A Nightmare on Elm Street, the film mm, debut mm-hmm. of one Jonathan Johnny, Depp. Johnny Depp. He gets murdered yeah, in the first, it, like, 30 minutes. He gets rendered into, like, chunks, and it's horrifying. But Nightmare on Elm Street is an utterly terrifying movie. And I was not old enough to see this movie when I saw it at the drive-in. And I may not be old enough to see this movie now, but, oh, my gosh, it is so good. I want to so introduce my perfect. oldest son, who is now 17? 16? Mm-hmm. I don't know how old he is. Uh, he's 17. Gotta be 17. Because we're almost right, well. 18. Uh, and um, and I don't know if, if it's appropriate for him to sit down and watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Just because it is I, just so gory and scary and all that stuff. But again, I watched it when I was 14, 15 years old. So look how I turned out. It can't be bad. Was Was that your... <laughs> Was that your kid who was cracking up at Alien? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, they are they are not yeah. gonna find Nightmare on Elm Street scary. They okay. are just no, not. This, this stuff well, I mean, they seen, watch just, you know, like, they watch uh Chainsaw Face Head Man and they're sure. watching uh the uh Demon Hunter, X Hunter, and Slayer Box or whatever that they're watching in the anime. So I have a feeling yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street is gonna be fairly tame. Yeah, it is. And the thing that the first one, I think the thing that really sells it is Freddy Krueger. Just I mean, Michael Myers is not necessarily even a character. And if you watch the the uh, Friday the 13th movies, Jason is just a cipher. It doesn't even show up until the second. But I actually saw the remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street from maybe 15 years ago. And it had Rorschach, uh, Jackie Earl, Bad News Bears. An incredible actor, just an amazing actor, a really good, couldn't pull it off. He could not pull off Freddy. And it's just, it's Robert England. That's the reason why A Nightmare on Elm Street is my number two, why it's an awesome movie. Go watch it right now. Be terrified and don't sleep for a week. All right, Rodrigo, what do you have for your number two? My number two is a movie that I've talked about before here on the show. Um, A lot of these movies... I on this list. They're on this list because we're doing 1984. If we're doing the 80s, a lot of these movies actually wouldn't be on my list. Um, but one movie that definitely would be on my list is The Neverending Story. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched The Neverending Story when I was relatively young, right? So for for context, these are the top five movies of 1984. I was one years old. Mm -hmm. in 1984 so the never-ending story might have been like the closest one between when it came out and when i watched it out of all of these because a lot of these are like scary or they're difficult to uh to get um but uh, i've talked about how uh i was terrified of gamork the like the giant wolf a uh, thing that comes out of the shadows. Yeah. Um, I was I was devastated when that one character dies. Um, <laughs> don't just say like, his name. Yeah, no, I well, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Like, Let's just say, if you see somebody cosplaying that at any kind of convention, it is the best. Oh, just nice. Right. Um. But yeah, never-ending story. I I've gone back and rewatched it a few times, and it it holds up in sort of like the general sense. In that, it's kind of a timeless. It is kind of a timeless story, mm-hmm. and you know, kids are never not going to be bullied, so right. the impetus is always there. 
Um, I think since then, there's been a lot of movies that basically there's a whole genre um, of like fantasy movies where the protagonist gets pulled in uh, or whatever. But this feels like very prototypical to that. Like without this, we don't get, you know, uh, I don't know, Kushigi Yugi or Inuyasha or uh, that thing where um, the guy gets teleported, where uh, the, the baseball player goes to. King Arthur's Court. I, don't know. <laughs> I think it's called a baseball player in King Arthur's Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one. Um, yeah, never ending story. It's uh, it's fantastic. And then if you want to turn around and read a horror story, find the um, find the statements and the the stories that were written of its production because it was mm. apparently absolutely harrowing. Yeah, uh, I think this is kind of a um, great movie for Gen Xers Mm -hmm. just because of the nothing and the existential dread that we have Mm. have lived with our entire lives. And I think that I I, I really do like this. I will say that it does. I don't think it holds up today because a few years ago I had both my kids watch it and they were bored. Uh, The oldest walked away. The youngest sat through it and at the end was like, meh, it's okay, I guess. My wife yeah, was watching not... it and she was in tears. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, and so I think that it, there's something about being a 1980s kid or, you know, and Rodrigo's a 1980s kid. I mean, he was born in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, there's something about that stuff that still resonates today. And I don't yeah. know if it's about depression or ennui or. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, as you know, kids. Cosmic like, horror. Kids like quote unquote kids these days. But like when I saw the never ending story, it was, it was already the nineties, right? Yeah. Like people were already extremely riding skateboards. Mm-hmm. Like the pacing yeah. of the never ending story is very slow. Yeah. So that like repels kids. But when you go back and watch it as an adult, it's beautiful and it's sad and it's bittersweet. And also, um, a movie without a like physical bad guy that you can punch. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's not an evil guy that's doing this. This is like a force. It's like, I, honestly, this type of like general, like oppression, oppressive, like uh, energy wouldn't be rep- repeated until the crudes, which I also recommend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Not a movie from the eighties. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I know. What you're, but if you want to yeah. watch the spiritual successor of the nothing, watch the crudes. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Here, here, here's, here's the thing. Uh, if this, if the 1984 version didn't resonate with people, perhaps, and I don't know, have a release date on this 25 or 26, perhaps the 2025 or 2026 remake of a never ending story will resonate with new audiences. We'll see. Yeah. Gilbert Gottfried ruined that movie for me. Why? Because he used to have a joke about the never ending story too. And he would say in that Gilbert way, if the one never ended, how the hell are they making a sequel? We're all the way up to like Final Fantasy 16. So yep. True. Yep. not the Final Fantasy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are in our number ones. I've already shared mine. Uh, the Karate Kid was my number one. But in the end, I've already shared that the number one box office was Ghostbusters. So what was the number two? What was the number two movie of 1984? Can, Rodrigo? Can we guess? And, yeah. and none of us have hit it. Nobody has hit it yet. Oh, yeah. I don't know. You want to take the guess first, Matthew? I got it. Okay. I got it. Eddie Murphy, Beverly Hills Cop. Yep, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, $224 million. Ghostbusters just beating it out. Uh, I did mention this as one of my top five comedies uh, last time we did top five, so that may have been a good uh, tip off there. But yes, Beverly Hills Cop from Paramount Pictures in at number two. Matthew, what is your number one movie from 1984? My number one movie is, honestly, and I, I say things on this show that are just dripping in irony, and I say this to you with in absolute truth. It is one of the best first appearances of any actor that I've seen. One of America's greatest modern actors. I am talking about Top Secret, the debut of Val Kilmer as Nick Rivers, a, an Elvis-style uh, rock star who ends up in Germany 
which somehow, even though it is 1984, is also Germany circa 1943. <laughs> and so it's this bizarre, timeless melange. And he's like, he's literally acting against Omar Sharif and Peter Cushing and Michael Guff, who, you know, I don't know if you know about Michael Guff, but he played Alfred four times for three different Batmans, one of whom was, in fact, Val yeah. Kilmer. But yeah, it is just an amazing movie, and it's it kind of presages his take in the doors in that he sings throughout this because he's playing a rock star. It it it, it is a Zucker Abraham Zucker movie, and that can always be questionable because those guys did Airplane, but they also did I think uh, like Epic movie, or at least one of them did. I don't know. But it's just, it's such a perfect film from top to bottom. There is one scene in the movie that is literally recorded backwards. But the the trick, the joke is that the man that they're speaking to is speaking in Swedish. So they're just running the actual audio track backwards. And the scene plays backwards. And you see like Val throw a book all the way up to the top of a big bookshelf when it actually came down to him. And at the end, to emphasize it, they slide up a fireman's pole to the upper level of the building. And I'm like, that is just, that is such a, a film nerd joke. And this movie is full of crazy stuff and full of references and full of humor and has one of my, my favorite stupid jokes ever. There's a singing pony and the singing pony sings for about two minutes and then they stop and Val Kilmer and his lady get out of the, the, truck they've been traveling in and the pony coughs and the girl's like oh is he okay and the man's like yeah yeah he's okay he's just a little horse yep all right there you go matthew's number one he's top a, secret he's a little horse rodrigo he's <laughs> what do you have for your number one? Oh, i left room for people to applause and, and applaud and laugh matthew yeah okay yeah good 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 yeah thank you yeah all right rodrigo uh what is your what is your number one my number one movie uh 1984 is not on the yeah, this is top movies, probably because it wasn't released in the United States in 1984. What? Um, but it was, in fact, released in Japan in 1984, and that's Nausicaa Ooh, of the Valley of, Valley the, of the, Wind. the Winds. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, I, I, I feel like... I, actually, that's not true. I was going to say that I'm glad that I didn't encounter this as a child. Again, because this is also a very slow-paced movie, at, at least at first. Um, but then I remember that I saw Lensman as a kid, and I saw a bunch of like other like just absolutely bonkers anime, and I'm like, I would have probably been okay with this kid. Um, Nausicaa is the story of a young girl who lives in a post, like post post apocalypse world where um, our like the uh, groups and nations and everything of the world have fallen away and now is just sort of about survival uh it's a story about dredging up the past and uh reckoning with the sins of the past it's a story about the future it's a story about nature and our relationship with it and the sort of like power that comes from understanding how nature works uh, rather than trying to like dominate it or or force it, um, it's got giant bugs in it. And mm -hmm. also, if you watch the English dub, I want to say Patrick Stewart is is in it. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said that he that he had a great time because the character that he dubs has a giant mustache, so you can't see his mouth. So unlike all the other actors who had to like awkwardly match the Japanese cadence of the character's mouths, he didn't have to. Because like the mustache would just move a little bit when that character talked, and he could just say whatever he needed as long as it fit inside the the mustache motions. So <laughs> yeah, it's a good it's a good anecdote. Yeah, very uh, cool. But yeah, uh, a Studio Ghibli film, and one that I, I feel doesn't get enough uh, yeah. praise. Um, but it's it's just as good as any of the other ones. Yeah. It's Seriously. just as good as princess Mononoke yep. or, um, yeah. Spirit uh, away castle yep. in the sky, which goes by a different name. Yeah. Yep. All that stuff. So, there you go. All right, go does ladies and gentlemen. Have, I can't remember. Does it have an explicit nuclear war? Nausicaa? It's, in, it's implied. Yeah. So, so I couldn't remember if they implied the, it or not. 
yeah, close to the end is like the the there's a weapon that they're trying to reignite essentially and it's like it takes the form of like a giant monster so i think it's more allegorically nuclear war but it has the same effect basically it's like you know it's it's you know it's japan they're like hey what if we had a thing about fighting someone it's like what if that thing was a robot it's like oh then yes a thousand percent better rubber stamps All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. Our top five movies of 1984. What'd you think? How did your list match up? Well, there's one place where you can share your list, and that is in the Major Spoilers Discord server. You can join the Major Spoilers Discord server absolutely free. There's a link in the show notes, and we are waiting to read your lists. Also, if you found value in the show, if you enjoyed the show, if you like the show, if you want to see the show continue, because, man, we could do the top five movies of 1985. 1987, et cetera's and so on. We can only do that with your help and your support, and you be- can become one of our our big fans. We will be big fans of yours, I guess is what I want to say, by becoming a patron today over at patreon.com slash major spoilers. Patreon.com slash major spoilers. A small monthly contribution can help keep this show going far into the future. By far into the future, I mean, you know, at least next year. Uh, so there you go. Head over to uh, the Discord server. Share your list. Why? Because everybody loves a list. This podcast is copyright 2024 by Major Spoilers Entertainment, LLC.